Because death from the soul's perspective is realizing you're not a body. Yeah. And and you're not in any kind of a container. You're not beholden to anything here. So the the practice and the the awareness of dying, what we call dying, is basically more and more realizing truly I'm not of this world. Yeah. I'm in it. The more you're not of the world, the more you can be here. And once you're fully here, you get to leave. <laughs> once you're fully here, you don't have to be here anymore. The reason everybody's still here and they don't have a choice in the matter is because they're constantly trying to get out of here. But once you're fully here, you don't you can leave. Now because you don't need this anymore. Well, what makes you fully here? It it's totally you realizing you're totally fully spirit. And all of this stuff doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. It's it's here for your learning so you can get to you can free yourself. And that's why none of us ever especially as children and the more aware as children we are uh the more we feel like we don't belong here because we don't yeah. Yeah, we but we have to be here but not belong you got to accentuate the positive Whoa! i feel good a bit of feel good goes a long way you're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just bad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? If you feel like that's what you want to do. Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. Well, I have one of my favorite favorite teachers back on the show <laughs> Michael Tamora Yay. welcome to the show again Michael thank you very much thank you so much lovely to be on your show yes and Michael of course and Raphael have their own radio show where they discuss all sorts of topics from I don't know what have you been discussing lately on the show on your show uh miracles I mean, our show is called, you know, the entire show is called Living the Miracle with Michael and Raphael Tamora. But uh, for this season, we have 13 episode seasons. And this season has been all about miracles. You know, miracles at sea, miracles at home, miracles in your relationships, miracles on the road. So it's been fun. One of my favorite topics. One of your, I know. Well, I have, I've got to read your bio. It talks, Michael lives the miracle. Well, um, was it Marianne Williamson or someone that said a miracle is a shift in perspective from fear to love? Do you, do, what do you think about that? Is that? That sounds good. <laughs> yeah, because, because miracle always happens out of time. So it's not in sequence. That's why people go, wow, it's, it's surprising, right? Mm-hmm. We don't expect it. It just happens and it doesn't happen according to what you expected on a logical sequence of events. Yeah. A logical and sequence. It's of because events. it's not in time. Yeah. Based and, in, based in linear time and based in past, past yes. understandings. Yeah. It's not of this world. Yeah. yeah. It's of spirit, right? Mm-hmm. So once we access spirit, we're in no time mm-hmm. and, and miracles can happen. Mm-hmm. If we turn away from spirit, then Miracles can't happen. This is, well, this is true. Look, let me read your bio. I've, I've got okay. the tribe, <laughs> the inner sanctum tribe, to um, put in some questions. I've got a whole stack of questions to ask you from <laughs> them. But Michael was our first cab off the rank, I like to say, first guest teacher in the inner sanctum this year. And we touched on some um, beautiful things. Look, every time Michael comes on the show or I talk to him, I just let him talk and then you know, you get these aha moments and then you start thinking about other things. So that happened in the inner sanctum. So there's a couple of things that I want to nut out with you today about your experiences that we haven't touched on before. Michael J. Tamora is a celebrated spiritual teacher, clairvoyant, visionary and award-winning author of You Are the Answer, 
discovering and fulfilling your soul's purpose. He lives the miracle. <laughs> <laughs> lives the miracle spiritually aware from childhood he sees everyone the way they are as immortal souls and guides thousands to healing awakening and their true life purpose he draws from years of intensive training profound past life recall nightly out of body sojourns uh, which i actually wanted to talk about in the last show but we didn't get to will you remind me do you have full memory <laughs> Would you have memory in the morning where you've been at night? Well, it's a little more for me. It's it's um, need to know, and also there's so much. You know, it's it's like um, what did you do last year? <laughs> you know, where do you start? Yeah. And so, and this is I do find that this is one of the difficulties people have. A lot of people would love to know and have much more experience and awareness of what they do when they're not here. <laughs> oh my God, me too. Yeah. But people don't realize, well, they are experiencing, they are aware, they are alive when they're sleeping, let's say, mm. um, or when they're in a coma or anything. Mm -hmm. And so you go out of the body, just, that means your consciousness isn't beholden to the sensory perceptions of the body. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's what an out-of-body experience is. So, which means you start to recognize there's so much more to consciousness, so much more to your awareness and to your life than just whatever you happen to be feeling, seeing physically, hearing, touching, all that kind of stuff. And it expands. So when you are experiencing more of what's not attached to the body, not part of the body experience, there's so much. In one night, there's in when you go to spirit, there's no time. So in one night of sleeping, here we call it, you know, I slept for six or eight hours. Mm -hmm. But in spirit, it could be it's eternity. So you can live your entire life of, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years in one night, if you so choose to. So every night when I put my body down to sleep and rest, and I go, I teach. That's one thing I do consistently mm -hmm. every night. Mm -hmm. And even within that context, there's too much. So if you were to ask me, what did you teach last night? Well, I can give you little bullet points, but in order to get into details, it would be, okay, what part, which, what dimension? Because when you're in spirit, you can teach on many different levels at once. When we're here in this body, talking through a mouth, <laughs> we have to say one word at a time. It's very frustrating sometimes, but <laughs> I know. and that's I know. why. <laughs> I was going to say, that's why my shows are so long. It's like, it takes so long to get information out. Whereas in spirit or when you're communicating telepathically, you can get, a great, you can get, I don't know, like hours of communication in one bang, one minute bang. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So, and that's why, some people, even if they say a few things verbally, people go, whoa, that was a lot. Mm -hmm. And then this, another person says almost exactly the same words, or they can say the exact same words, and it's not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. It all depends on how much they're actually communicating spirit to spirit. You know? and, and that's and what being out of the body is, being in spirit. Thanks. So anything goes. Mm -hmm. Look, and also, I think I was just thinking about this this morning or yesterday, uh, you know, listening to things over and over again, I find as I've learnt, uh, you understand something and you go, oh, that makes sense. And then you can hear it again and again and again, and you can get ever deeper understandings of the same concept, yes. you know, like yep. it just drops and drops and drops. So, you know, a lot of the stuff we talk about on the show is very repetitive, but then it's this dropping into this knowing and starting to live it more viscerally. Anyway, let me finish this bio. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should give up the bio. 
<laughs> I don't know. It says you were born in Japan. That's kind of obvious if you're watching the YouTube. Educated in America. Uh, you've been featured on many shows, CNN, Lisa. Oh, look, you've been all over the place. Um, I discovered you through Bill Bennett. Uh, he interviewed you mm-hmm. for his uh, fabulous doco, PGS, Personal Guidance System, Intuition. And, uh, and, you're, in his, and you're in his next doco. He's kind of uh, exploring fear. And you oh, and I was Raphael. afraid of that. <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> you and Raphael are both in it, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, which oh, I can't wait for that to, to see what he does with that because he's, uh, he's a bit brilliant. Uh, oh, Bill. yeah, he is. Um, okay, so we've touched on out of body and need to know basis. Uh, I know because every morning I have that frustration of not having any kind of memory. Sometimes I have profound memories, profound, and but most of the time I don't. And I think my guides have pretty much said the same thing. They said, if you knew what you got up to at night, it would just be too confusing in your daily life to, to like, Mm -hmm. to have this sequential uh, linear experience of your daily life. It would be just too confusing because I think I get around when I'm sleeping. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And people who have very vivid recall of something they do out of the body at night, that's just one little part of the whole thing. It's, mm-hmm. it's just picking, okay, what do we want to talk about? Let's pick that topic. But as you know, we can talk about a zillion things. We can't talk about it all at once. So if we have a couple hours slot to talk about something, we usually pick, okay, we're going to talk about this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. But we have so much other stuff going on. Yeah. So being out of the body is like that. Well, I've said to people, and I said this to you too, uh, the first time I had you on the show, I had this realisation, I kind of recognised you as one of my teachers in spirit. <laughs> and, um, you know, for years I travelled the world and travelled, you know, through life asking to meet a guru. I read the book Yogananda's Autobiography of a Guru and, and mm-hmm. he had his beloved teacher who was very st- strict, I found, but uh, I kept thinking, oh, I want a teacher, I want a teacher. And the <laughs> irony of all of this is that I never found someone that was a teacher in the physical, even though I've spoken with and been to many gurus and everything uh, until you. And then I'm at this point in my life where I don't need a teacher. <laughs> that's the irony. Yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> when I wanted one, he, he weren't there. And now I've got that complete access to my own mob, as I call them, or teachers in spirit. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of interesting how it all works, isn't it? Uh, mm-hmm. And they said to me, you know, like stop looking for the teacher outside yourself. The guru is within. Was very clear message that they gave me. So that was my experience. Um, but I've interviewed so many beautiful teachers on the show. You being one of them. Okay, when I had you into the when we had you into the inner sanctum, you were speaking about your near death experience, the first one I think, where you were with this group of humongous beings and angelic realm angels, I think we called them. And was that the first one? Well, I think that's a mixture of first and second. Um, The first one is when I was taken, I I was taken by, escorted by a huge angelic being to like a conference room and board meeting. And it was with, including that archangel, uh, there were, four other five five altogether of masters of wisdom uh waiting for me and so that was my first experience the second time uh second near-death experience during the ambulance ride over the mountain pass i just went out and and i bumped into (laughs) like a semi-circle of large beautiful golden beings of light and one of them stepped down and became this angelic figure, uh, and you know was like a was like a uh, loving mother scolding her child, <laughs> going, "Not yet, you know, you're not supposed to come out here again." So I said, oh, "I'm just checking in." <laughs> so she brought me all the way back to the body in the ambulance. Uh, and so in the so, subsequent other, yeah. so you've had five near-death experience. 
in the other ones you didn't have that same experience of, of being hanging out with the mob the gang the spirit team yes and no the third one was what i experienced as the most complete total uh big one the big one <laughs> and apparently according to Raphael and everybody else it was the big one here on earth which i have no recall of mm -hmm. at all mm -hmm. and uh, all the other ones i do have a recall of you know going out and coming back with the third one it was instant and my experience was just like being sucked out with a hydraulic tube you know really strong hydraulic thing just and instantly one moment i'm in the body in a gym working out uh on a uh, elliptical machine mm -hmm. and the next instant i'm for a lack of a better i mean there's no description to it i'm my subjective experience after i came back from that is like being at in front of the eternal flame of god's love and those are just words, but it's, there's words just go out the window because where I was, there wasn't even, I can't even say I was there because it wasn't there yes, it and it wasn't me. <laughs> I know. I know. It, it's like a non-experience. Yeah. But it's not nothing. It's, it's everything, but it's, it's non-experience. And nothing. And after that, is when little by little there's been a, there was a shift in the consciousness where i start to have a little bit at a time this sense at first it's just like a sense it's not like here i am it's a sense of being mm, different or having a relationship with God instead of just being. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that part was very mm, dramatic because it seemed like I was surrounded by this incredible purity mm -hmm. and that purity was moving. And it looked like when I look back at it, it looked like these giant white, pure white wings just flapping around. And each of these gigantic beings, these angels, you know, that's where I, when I came back, I'm going, okay, is that what, what uh, I think somewhere in the Old Testament, the term seraphim comes up mm -hmm. and to describe the highest order of angels and they're right around God. And that's exactly what I experienced was there's a space that I can't even talk about. And then the first inkling that I, I can start to have some kind of a experience of being able to say this is what happened was the experience of these about four or five, I don't know how many, but just a few few of these gigantic angels and the the experience was one of absolute total purity it's it's just like there's not a microbe there's <laughs> there's not one you know little teeny particle of something that's not totally pure and so then once i experienced that there was this experience of turning around. I didn't have a body in that space. There's nothing like a body or anything like that. But the consciousness turns around and looks what outward from where the center of all of this, God, is. Then I'm looking over the sea of hundreds of thousands of angels. They're not that big they're they're just it looked like you know when you looking over this you see nothing but the ocean mm -hmm. and let's say from a cruise ship or something and you're just looking at this vastness of the ocean but but the winds are up and so it's choppy so you see all these white caps mm -hmm. if you were to imagine 
seeing just tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of white caps in concentric circles all around you. And no matter which way I turn at that point, I'm seeing these sea of wings going up and down, kind of flapping of all these angels. And all these angels, it's like they're, it's not like chanting, it's not like singing, but it's like a little of both. Mm. It's, it's this, you can feel the music and you can, you can see it. And it's like this constant repetition. And this is what leads up to that total purity. But this too is totally pure. Nothing but nothing. No thoughts, no anything can get through this landscape of total purity. Mm -hmm. So that was my coming, the very, very, very first inkling of returning to something as a as opposed to nothing nothing the other <laughs> it's no, not it's beyond something and nothing yeah everything and, and nothing yeah. all, all and beyond that mm. but that was the first inkling of okay i'm returning and then from there i got taken to where there's other beings mm -hmm. and oh no first i got taken to this empty space it's like being in the middle of the outer space somewhere. No planets, no stars, no nothing. No particles of anything. And it's like floating in the middle of this. Just like outer space is dark, but it's not dark. You know, it's, it's light, but dark. <laughs> and there's an there's a experience of total lightness, except it's dark. And there's nothing there. I'm floating in the middle of that. And it feels like there's a sense of uh, I'm in the middle of uh, some kind of a completely transparent tube. And then it's like uh, black curtains were lifted from this tube. Now I can see all around. And once I could see all around, what started to happen was all these images people, monsters, just horrific images, angry images, hateful, everything you could imagine, just shooting at me. It's like coming right at me at high speed, and it's just going shh. And I realize I have this total knowing, oh, this is the beginning of training. This is beginning of some type of advanced training that I'm receiving in preparation for going back to the body and to the earth, earthly life. And so I thought, okay. And I knew instantly what I'm to do is not resist any of it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's all in our mind where we resist, right? Mm -hmm. When we're here and thinking about stuff and somebody shows you a really grotesque picture and you go, oh, or you smell something really bad and you go, oh. <laughs> it's just like considered normal reactions mm -hmm. of a human being. We all do that. But in the mind is where it's formulated. And so it's in reaction to whatever you see, you feel, experience here. And that's what I realized, oh, I'm getting this training of having everything thrown at me that normally I might go, yuck, or I hey, get that out of, away from me, or resist it in some way, shape, or form. And I realize, oh yeah, this is a test for how much can I be totally non-resistant, total letting everything pass through, not even a flicker. And without, you know, it's not like gritting your teeth and going, okay, you know, throw me your best shot. I'm not going to twitch even if it hurts. No, it doesn't hurt because it doesn't hit you. Yes. When you're not, uh, not in opposition, when you're not a separate divided entity fighting against what you think is coming at you, it's nothing. And so every time it came, it looks so real feel so real until it comes and i as long as i didn't resist it it just disappears 
It just passes right through and disappears. And I got to see, that's what all this is about. Everything's made up that way. And to the extent that we put our energy and our creative power into it, we make it real to ourselves in our mind. And then pretty soon we're living in it and, and running away from it as if it's going to kill us. Absolutely. And when you believe it, that it can kill you, you in that scenario, you get killed. Oh, <laughs> Absabsolutely. Absolutely. What you resist persists. You create your own reality. What you persist persists. You know, we've had these messages so many times in spiritual circles, but understanding it, really living it, really living it. Oh, yeah, what you resist. Look, and... <clears throat> And we get challenged on a daily basis. Daily but, basis. <laughs> but, you know, a friend of mine has just lost her son. He was in his 30s. He'd suffered a lot of depression. She's been a spiritual hippie her whole life. And this death experience, I think, is the experience that really tests us. Are you going to buy into the illusion or are you going to meet it with the expanded understanding of eternity of um, death is not real, that you can still communicate with that being that you call son or daughter or mother or father or lover. And yeah, it's just where, yeah, tested on a daily basis about this, Mm -hmm. not what you resist persists. Can you meet life with that detached loving presence? Can you meet? So let me ask you this. Um, you were given this experience and you're already a spiritual teacher and a master before then. How did that experience change you after you came back? It still is changing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, I always say that a miracle is a gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. You know, you call the instant where it happens and you experience something. Oh, that was a miracle, but it's, it's never in past time because miracles out of time, it's ongoing. And even if the experience that you called the miracle was done with, the gift, the lesson, the learning continues. Mm-hmm. So this is one of those, it just goes on and on and on. Just like you said at the beginning when you were uh, opening this show, that after a while, you know, if people listen to you and watch your show uh, every time, oh yeah, I heard that before. You already said that before. Mm -hmm. People who write it off because they heard the words before, they're missing out on the whole thing. (laughs) And this is what happens sometimes when people think it's better to be more advanced. Now I'm an advanced student or advanced teacher or something like that supposed to be better and higher but what that really means is the further along you get on your path the more you're able to learn from everyone all the time in the simplest little thing where everybody else around you is saying oh yeah yeah, i already heard that before oh i already already know that before now but for you it becomes oh wait a minute this is i never heard this before not in this way. Mm-hmm. And, and the light bulb goes on. So my experience that I had there when I came back, even before, like you said, for years and years and years, most of my life, I've been practicing learning to let go of resisting anything. And in Hence the beginning, you five know, NDEs and illness and gout and heart attacks and, you know, can I meet excruciating pain can i meet heart attacks can i meet death with like oh this will be fun (laughs) yeah yes after it's done it's really fun (laughs) and even when it's not fun i mean it's never fun you know if a loved one dies it's not a fun thing it's going yay great that person died well i do can't be. Oh, that's I'm what happy my for the transitioned. Like, yes, I was told. Same with my mom. Yeah, I was told years before. I was told when he was going to transition. In that they said, when his last child leaves school, he'll leave the planet. And she was mm-hmm. literally on schoolies, like she'd finished her exams, 
because he was married three times, had lots of kids. She was, um, you know, she was doing the schoolies thing, you know, where you go and party after school and he transitioned uh-huh. during that time. And I'm like, God, they were spot on, weren't they? And just like, oh, yeah, it was like just, yeah, you can be joyous. Anyway, go on, go on, please go on. Yeah, I mean, exactly. When my mom died, it was joyous. Mm-hmm. When Shanti died, our dog, mm-hmm. uh, joyous. When my teacher died, joyous. It's, it's it's, they were joyous because the one leaving was joyous. Mm, okay. You know, other ones, sometimes souls struggle until the very last moment oh. saying, I don't want to die yeah, yeah. or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then the people around them think that they don't want them to die because they love them, but it's not, that's not really it. They don't want them to die because they want to keep him in a certain uh, place, in a mm-hmm. certain way. Mm-hmm. They want them to keep their identity, whereas that soul is ready to give it up. Mm-hmm. And so, so one of the things, consistent things I've discovered with each death, each time I come back, each time I leave, I, one of the first things besides timelessness that I experience is, oh, yeah, and here there's still more selfishness, right? In, within myself, mm-hmm. selfishness, meaning me first, me, it's about me. Life mm-hmm. is about me. Mm-hmm. And what I've learned time and time again, and, and throughout the times after I come back from these death experiences, I've learned, oh yeah, there I go again. You know, I'm thinking life is about me and it's not my life isn't about me. <laughs> Almost everybody assumes, well, we're talking about my life. If, it's, if we're talking about my life, it's about me, and it's not. Well, I know. That's a hard concept for most people to grasp because everyone <laughs> thinks their life's about them. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, we, we know we nut this stuff out. We talk about, you know, there's only one person in the room. I was saying to my tribe that in the book's Conversation with God, That's the thing that just kept repeating. There's like, there's only one of us in the room. There's only one of us in the room. You know, like we are one, we are one, (laughs) we are one. And from this separate linear perspective, understanding the unity and the oneness of all is not always that easy, especially when you meet someone or something that you disagree with. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, it's the spirit is one. We're one as spirit. Bodies look different and separate and does whatever it wants to do (laughs) and so it's it's this vastness of spirit that never changes and if we turn within that's what we start to discover is when we first turn in a lot of people have a hard time with meditation because okay close your eyes and get quiet and breathe and relax and all that stuff well what's the first thing that happens to most people when they turn within for the first time or you know first thousand times <laughs> all the junk that they haven't dealt with in their mind they become aware of mm-hmm. you know when we're running around like a chicken with a head cut off trying to go here and do this and then meet that deadline and pay that bill and i gotta make more money and da 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 and oh no what am i gonna do we're so noisy to ourselves we don't notice all kinds of junk is making noise Mm -hmm. in our space, in our mind. And when we stop chasing after everything and quiet down, then we notice our internal life, an internal part that's just constantly going, blah, 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 how about this, about that, about this. And we go, whoa, God, I I don't want to sit here and listen to all that. But this is part of the beginnings of, learning to meditate is letting go of all that stuff. People talk about quiet the mind or still the mind, empty the mind, shut off the mind, whatever way you want to look at it. But it's not so much do something to your mind. It's emptying your mind out of the contents you've constantly kept in there that heretofore you weren't aware of. Or... Rather than emptying the mind, I think that's probably one of the hardest things humans can ever even attempt to empty the mind or witnessing it from a detached point of view. Just like you said, when you were coming through the stratosphere 
and you were witnessing all this stuff coming at you. And then as you witnessed it and didn't get attached to it, it just went through yes. you, it dissolved. So we can do that in meditation. As the stuff exactly. comes up, you can just go, oh, hello, yeah, and just not react, not resist it, not react mm -hmm. to it. But I find, oh, I don't know, meditation is different for me now, but when I first started meditating, as all this stuff came up, trying to quieten it or rid it <laughs> was like torture. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> But when someone gave me the perspective of just witness it and just, you know, tr try not to react to it, and it's like that was, a, that was something I could get my teeth into. Like, oh, yeah. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. very good. Yeah, yeah, that works. It's everybody's got to find some way to, you know, not doing something is impossible. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. It's like saying, okay, don't think of a pink elephant. Yeah, yeah. And then next thing, everybody's thinking about pink elephant. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I heard that's true with like training dogs and stuff. If you tell a dog, don't do something, all they see is the picture of what you're telling them not to do, not yeah. the don't do it part. Okay? So, so you have to show them a picture of what you would like them to do rather than what you don't want them to do. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the ways to get out of the resistance to things is, okay, if you're, if you're trying to quiet the mind, oh yeah, instead of trying to go against the noise and do something about the noise, like you say, if you just let it pass by, it mm. just, uh, Jesus used to say, let it them be as passers by, right? Just oh, walking yeah. by, yeah. and you can say hello, you know, nice to see you, bye bye, mm -hmm. keep going, right? You don't so get, it's, st get stuck. It's a bit like your experience with spirit as above, so below. Uh, there was something that you said in the Inner Sanctum that when you were with these big angels, then there was this other place of that no thing, that nothing, that eternal everything that was completely outside of all manifested reality including spiritual reality uh, like spirit reality like non-physical mm -hmm. realities because there's many non you know yes physical realities oh, words are so but such a thing. <laughs> anyway yeah, once you get to that place there's there's no words <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so um i guess that we can attempt to try and sort of access you know be in the bodies and try and access that place which is sort of above or beyond the drama, the human drama, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the happy and the sad. Is that, is that something, do you want to explain that a bit more? Yeah, like, that's when I teach uh, people to be in the center of their head. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people think, oh, don't be so much in your head. Mm -hmm. But that's not the same being in the center of your head isn't being analytical and all of that. That's not in the center. <laughs> When, when you just close your eyes and be in the center of your head, at first, you're not really in the center, so you don't experience that total neutrality. But with practice, a person starts to recognize, oh yeah, no matter how cluttered my mind is, no matter how noisy, you know, how many thoughts and ex feelings and everything's going wild and how upset I am, a lot of times people will notice if you can catch them right when they're really upset, there's a point right in the center of their head where there's no upset. Everything around it is terribly upset. The, it feels like this and that and everything. But if you just go to the center of your head, it's completely still. There's nothing going on. Nothing's changing. Nothing's moving. Nothing's going up and down. It's just complete still neutral like the, that spirit like the calm in the middle of the hurricane like the, yep exactly mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's interesting. if you practice that regularly you know when a person practices that regularly after a while you start to go oh yeah there's the center of my head and it's you could be so upset but the minute you find that pinpoint just a tiny little pinpoint you touch that and it just oh I feel better. It's quieter. I'm, you know, I still am agitated, but not as much. And you just keep on being back into that center of your head. And next thing, oh, all that's gone. Because that 
spirit, allness, limitlessness, light. You just put, you can't keep a shadow in the light. You can't make darkness in the light. The minute there's a shadow and you take away the whatever's making that shadow, shadow's not real. It's just uh, eclipsing the light. Mm -hmm. So if you put some illusion, some image, some thought that holds the you know, light away, then you don't experience that light and call it darkness. But the minute you put that illusion in the light, it disappears because nothing stays in that light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can't be separate in that light. So when you say the center of your head, would it be like visualizing your pineal gland? Like just sort of like if we were like to have a visual just... To uh, it, it's not the physical center per se. Mm -hmm. Just if you think in terms of center of your head, you know, somewhere in the middle, then you start to find that stillness. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you have to have a ruler and measure exact physical no, center. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it is related. When you're in the center of your head, you could access your pineal gland and your third eye and everything a lot more easily. Absolutely. But, um, yeah. Absolutely. And being in the center of your head is like being in the driver's seat yeah. of the body. Yeah. And really the driver's seat of the mind. Yeah. You know, a lot of people want to develop their spiritual, uh, sorry, psychic abilities, which is a question someone asks. Uh, but yeah, I found personally, the more I meditated, the more that I accessed that. You know, the mm -hmm. more I um, detached or quietened the mind or detached from being resistant to the mind. Yeah. All righty. I, I, I'm going to get into the questions because there's a few of them. And I'm just going to give you what Kristen says. I don't have any questions, but I'd like to let Michael know. I love his smiling spirit and the quotes <laughs> he posts on Facebook lighten my heart and make me think. Thinking is good as it gets me out of my own head. I adore him. That's from Kristen. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Kristen. <laughs> uh, it's funny that she says, gets me out of my head. Uh, but thinking is good because it gets me out of my head. I guess she's saying, thinking about what you've posted on Facebook, you know, thinking mm -hmm. outside your human drama gets you away from your human drama and gives you that broader perspective. It kind of yes. pulls you back. Just like what we've been talking about, pulls you back from being in it. So that you can mm -hmm. witness it with no resistance, with non-resistance. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, she's talking about the, the thinking about uh, the quotes and whatnot gets her out of the head means, too, she's reflecting on the meaning, deeper meaning of it, that then you're, you're looking at it. You're, you're meditating on it rather than thinking analytically about it. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. That's why it's not that analytical mishmash. <laughs> mishmash. <laughs> That's her last name. Anyway, <laughs> Chris uh, Sissel says here, just love, just love Michael. <laughs> and hey. uh, why are there so many people experiencing lack of energy? And she's got me in, in big letters. And what would be the best way to help them get back in alignment with themselves? This is, ah. a, this is a complaint I hear a lot in the spiritual community yes. is um, lack of energy. When I have lack of energy, I just think because I'm unfit and, you know, I, probably, you know, I should probably do some more exercise. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Why do lots of people well, have lack of energy? Even, even the do more exercise part, yes. You know, when you do the correct kind of physical exercises, you tend to have more energy. Mm. What's going on? Well, one thing I know, when you exercise, physically work out, you're getting everybody else's energy out of your space, out of your mind, out of your body, okay? So running around the block, you, you tend to get rid of a lot of excess baggage. <laughs> so you feel better afterwards because you're more yourself in your body. But how many others, especially the people who are, writing in the questions, are all healers. So they have extra amount of other people's baggage and often garbage <laughs> because everybody's going, help me, help me, help me. I have this problem. Please help me. This is, you know, 
do something about this. And they keep on giving you, you know, giving the healer their problems, thinking that's what you're supposed to do. But the healer can't solve their problem if they give it to them. <laughs> You're muted, I think. Sorry, I forget I mute myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, so tiredness, there's a few things coming up. Tiredness for people kind of on the, you know, on the um, seeking journey, they start asking questions. As they start to sort of become more aware of broader perspective, they start to expand their field. And as they expand their field, now they've got access, more access to other people's fields. And so mm -hmm. they can pick up a lot of stuff that's a vibrational match to their stuff. This is what happened to me when I was young. Oh my God, just going to the supermarket was almost like torture. I had to, <laughs> I had to clean up my own vibration because I'd expanded my field so much that I was just, I had access to everyone else's drama. Mm -hmm. And yes. it was just overwhelming for me when I would go out in public. But um, yeah, so that's one perspective. And, and as a healer, then people are throwing their their problems at you which can sort of stay stuck in your field mm -hmm. ah that's so interesting yeah. that exercise cleans your field i had never heard that before that's going to make me so exercise more <laughs> <laughs> but also even faster and more effective is meditating right and and meditating on an energy level then you start to recognize oh wait a minute even this feeling and the thought you know how when you're tired, you tend to go, I'm so tired, I'm so tired. And you tell everybody, I'm so tired. You gotta step, you know, back up and ground yourself and go, wait a minute, how much is that is me? How much of it is not me? That's the really important question, is how much of it is not me? And you could use your intuitive knowing, you could even just create a mock up a gauge in your mind of zero to 100%. How much of it is not mine? And then you look at that gauge from zero to 100 and just ask, okay, let it show me what percentage of, oh, I'm so tired, is not mine. And then you get, oh, 72%. <laughs> That's significant. Gee, if I were only tired, you know, 28% of what I'm feeling, would I be complaining? Oh, no, that's just a little bit tired. That's not a big deal. I can yeah. still do whatever I want to do. But 72% of, oh, I'm so tired. If you were to get rid of that, you wouldn't be so tired. And, and how to get rid of that is so absolutely simple. Again, where's energy? Energy is consciousness. It's, it's all you experience it in your consciousness, in your mind. And so you just have that energy go into that rose rose is a great symbol to use everybody knows what a rose looks like so i use a rose to put it in there okay all this 72 percent of i'm so tired that's not mine oh let's let it go and put it in there because when we're going oh i'm so tired i'm so tired we're constantly trying to solve the problem mm -hmm. of why am i so tired you know what do i do to not get so tired constantly fighting this energy we experience as tiredness. Mm. But what if you just let go of it? As long as you try to solve it, you're going to hold on to it. Mm. And you can't solve it because it's not yours, the energy. We could only solve energy that we produce. Even if it's the same kind of energy that somebody else produces, we can't solve that because it's not ours to mm. solve. Mm. It just doesn't compute. It's like putting diesel fuel in a gasoline engine. So do you Doesn't think the, the very um, feeling of tiredness, you know, beckoning you to sleep, do you think that sleep clears your field anyway? Sometimes, sometimes not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> depends, depends. One thing that's important, uh, a great time to meditate, especially clean up your energy field before you go to bed. Okay. Then you'll sleep better. Okay. People think, oh, I'll have too much energy. No, you need energy to get out of the body. Mm -hmm. If you're depleted, that's that much less energy and power you have to fully step out and go, 
hey, I'm out of here. Mm. When we get out of the body at night, it gives the body a chance to rest, and but it also gives our mind and spirit a chance to rest. Absolutely, yeah. And then when we come back, we're refreshed. But how come that doesn't happen? How come we might have gotten eight hours of sleep, but when we wake up, it feels like an army tromped through our you know, body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gee, I wasn't exercising or doing heavy labor <laughs> while I was sleeping. That's when, when you left the body, when you fell asleep, left the body as the soul, you, the soul, as the soul, you're in charge of the body. When you leave it, if you don't leave the body in a high enough vibration, it's like open house. It's like leaving your house in a bad neighborhood uh, <laughs> unlocked. Really? <laughs> What's the chances of getting burglarized? Really? Interesting. And then, especially in this day and age where it's an international society, right? So if you're in business, people on the other side of the planet are thinking of you while you're sleeping. Uh -huh. It's their daytime and they're writing emails and texting and posting something, you know, on a social site towards you thinking that, oh, even if you're asleep, you don't have to, you know, if you're not asleep, if you're asleep, you don't have the computer on, you're not at your desk, I won't be bothering you. But they don't realize if they don't do those texts and emails from their own space and know how to communicate spirit to spirit with a person, they're shooting their in their mind, their idea of you is your body, what you look like, you know, hair, clothes, and nice glasses, <laughs> everything else. <laughs> so in their mind, they're writing you an email and going, oh, Karen, you know, how are you? I know you're sleeping right now, but I just wanted to share this good news with you and blah, blah, blah. But if they're all over you, they're throwing all this, even if it's a joyful, fun, good energy, but they, they so want you to know this and they're tossing all that energy, even if it's a good energy, it's not going to work in your body. And that energy is directed to your sleeping body, not to you as spirit, who's somewhere else, you know, having a great time. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. Because, you know, you're spot on, like, because I'm in Australia and a lot of the people I speak to are in the States. A lot of activity happens, like, at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, my time, which mm -hmm. is, I don't know, whatever time that is in the States. But, um, uh, yeah, so I wake up to a lot of emails and a lot of, um, you know, messages and yeah. Yes. And uh, but what I find is I usually engage in them as soon as I wake up, which I probably shouldn't do. Yeah, first, <laughs> Before I even me. get out of bed, I'm looking on the phone going, oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then yeah. it doesn't give you a chance to clear up the energy that you're coming into first. Yeah. And if you do that, you'll be able to take care of those emails a lot better later. Yes. Okay, so how, uh, all right, so um, this is a question that's arisen. I've got a million other questions, but uh, how, classically, how often does the consciousness, soul, spirit, whatever you want to call it, stay in the body before it leaves at night? So it's obviously when you're sleeping, you're kind of re, you're doing things before you get out, like you're, you're in your body sort of adjusting your frequency, are you? Sort of letting it rest like you're, Oh, I'm rabbiting here, but um, yeah. So how long are you doing that? <laughs> how long do you do that before you classically jump out and go flying around the universe? It's completely up to each person. Right. Because the more aware the soul is, mm -hmm. the more they prepare for takeoff, so to speak. Right. Okay. Whereas a soul that's completely, you know, believes that they're the body and when they go to sleep, it's just nothing and everything shuts off. And until they come back, or they don't even come back to the body until it turns on again in the morning, miraculously. And, oh, it's like being dead over the night. You know, nothing happens. And a lot of people think that when you, when you die, nothing happens. But once you start to become aware, oh, it's a continuum. It it's, doesn't end. And it doesn't begin when you wake up. And it doesn't end when you go to sleep. It's ongoing. Life is ongoing. Consciousness is ongoing. So you start to prepare yourself. Okay, I'm going to go to sleep. Some people, this would be ideal if you could meditate even just for 10, 15 minutes 
before you hop into bed mm -hmm. and stop doing all your, you know, Facebooking and emailing and texting and everything else. <laughs> and just find your, collect yourself up from the day and, and clean up your energy field and, and in your mind and quiet it down and just release all this stuff that you're carrying around as much as you can. Then you go to bed, you're ready. Your energy, you're in your own space. Nobody okay. else is bothering you. Okay. Your energy field isn't set to the world. It's set to you as spirit. Mm -hmm. So when you leave, your body is just humming along. And even if people throw energy at your body, there's a lot less likelihood that it gets stuck. Right, because right. the people who are awake on a physical level, generally they're thinking on a physical body level. Mm -hmm. And that's why they shoot the energy to the body instead of to you. And their energy is much lower. Mm -hmm. But when your body's set up on that meditation, higher spirit energy level, when you leave, all that lower energy just goes right on through and doesn't mm -hmm. affect it. This is so interesting. I love talking to you, Michael. Okay. <laughs> so for people that have lost loved ones, sons, daughters, and they feel like they can't at this point, because I think everyone can connect with them psychically while they're awake in their physical body, they can do this sort of meditation preparation and then have an intent to hang out with my loved ones and then have an intent to remember that when I come in the morning. So you can kind of set that up before you go to yes. sleep at night, right? Yeah, uh, you can definitely do that. I think that a lot of us do hang out with our loved ones, um, but we don't remember it in the morning. Or if we do, it's like a crazy dream and it doesn't make sense. Or sometimes it's like nightmares where they're suffering, you're suffering. And yeah, so um, you can sort of set that up before you go to sleep at night in a meditation, in a yes exercise. Sort of and anyway. the way you bring information back, that's a whole other thing. People think, you know, you bring, everybody brings back information to their body consciousness the same way. And it, no. I mean, some people, even just in the waking times, some people are much more tuned into feeling everything. Other people are much more tuned into hearing everything. Others are seeing everything or knowing. And so those are all different avenues through which we bring back information mm -hmm. from more spirit or even from the you know, worldly levels. And so when you go out, if you're more to go out of the third chakra, the solar plexus area, if you ground your body from the first chakra to the center of the earth, and then put your attention on the third chakra for a few minutes and just go, okay, I'm going to remember. I'm going to go out and go visit this person and that person. And then I'm going to remember that. And when I wake up in the morning, you do that every night for 30 days. Uh -huh. And generally, most people will start to remember bits and pieces at least of what goes on, at least some of what goes on uh, when they go out. Because so the memory for the out-of-body experience is in the third chakra. Okay. Well, there you go. You've just answered my question. There you go, third chakra. Right. So every okay. chakra so has don't, a don't level eat. that before you go to bed because then your third yeah, chakra is digesting food. Yeah. yeah. yeah that the fasting. energy gets diverted. Yeah. And then, but a lot of times I go out from my top, you know. Right. I open the hatch. <laughs> so crown chakra, that's the center of intuitive knowing. Mm -hmm. So if you go out and come back through your crown chakra, it's not going to be the same type of memory. It's going to be Certain you, you're going to know, oh, yeah, I was out teaching. I was teaching about healing a certain level. And I was with these students and part of the time, and I took these students to, to a field trip <laughs> and things like that. You know all that stuff. And, and then as you know it, you can look at if you want to see the visuals or if there were any kind of a visual part of the experience you can tune down into the visual aspect and check in on it but the the information continuum is on the knowing level mm -hmm. much much higher but it's less tangible mm -hmm. it's just you know it and then the third chakra it's much more tangible 
more, more tangible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, look, I've heard there's, you know, Cyrus Kirkpatrick who um, helped me with the first book, Awakened by Death, is a deliberate astral traveler. He can deliberately yeah. pop out of the body. And he once said that he was with his flatmate and he popped out of his body at night and he went into his flatmate's room and he saw his flatmate's body sleeping, but he saw the astral body, for a better word, outside. Mm -hmm. But still in the bedroom, like he hadn't gone anywhere, but outside the body and he was kind of looking confused and really wasn't even aware of. So some people can pop out of the body and just stay standing next to the body, can't they? And then some people go, Foop, I'm out of here, go flying around the cosmos or go visit relatives. So there's all sorts <laughs> of different things that we can do. Some people just like hover around the body. Just a hover. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's all different levels of consciousness and frequency. Those who have those types of, uh, sometimes they're called exteriorization, uh, out-of-body experiences, it's on, a, it's on a frequency band that's right inside and, and just one step up from the physical yeah, frequency. Yeah, astral, physical it's astral. On the etheric, yeah, yeah. It's on the etheric yeah. level. Mm -hmm. And that level, there's no transcending time yet. Mm -hmm. When you go out at that level, that's what you hear when somebody says, oh, I was floating, you know, outside my body when they were operating me uh, on me uh, on, the, on the, uh, mm -hmm. the surgery. Mm -hmm. that's, that's on the etheric level. And they remember when they come back oftentimes uh, and remember, it's very vivid. Oh, I, I can describe the, the hallway and the nurses and blah, 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 and what you said. Uh, when you were cutting me open and things like that. And if you, in that condition out of the body, you look at the clock in the surgery operating room, you'll say, and you said uh, you were talking about your golf game uh, at 6.35. <laughs> and, and it would be correct mm. because it's in objective time here in this physical universe because you're still in time, just not in the body, physical. But you can walk through walls. Yeah. And then yeah. if you go a step further in and, and higher, then you'll be in the beginning of what most people call astral realities, you know, astral places. And in the lower levels, there's all still the body mm -hmm. image and, and you can talk to each other, shake hands, hug, whatever. And there's astral earth. There's, there's yeah, there's astral, astral earth. And you and, can kind of experience things on astral earth as if physical. I know a girlfriend of mine did this after she died because she was sick and she couldn't travel. So when she died, she mm -hmm. stayed in her astral body and traveled the world with her boyfriend who died as well. So they went, yeah. you know, they did what they didn't do on physical earth. They did on astral earth. Yes. Yeah. And, but then at that level, there's no time. The time is not really the same. time as we know it here. And so they can traverse space like go different places just as a mere thought and you're there and they can go to the past but they can't go to the future hmm. at that level the future comes in the next level and so then there's different you know this is why i don't use too many terms some some metaphysicians like to label each level and call it this and that and this and that mm. it gets too complicated and confusing so it's either in the body or out of the body but mm -hmm. it all depends on what frequency you go to and that all depends also on your state of consciousness and and what you're interested in mm -hmm. and that's why you get when you know after death you get souls that are only interested in the world yes. things of the world yeah, yes. money. I, I, I didn't get, I didn't make my last, you know, $3. Yeah. <laughs> you owe it to me. <laughs> and then other souls that are only interested in maybe off world dimensions, like you know, yeah. hanging out with yeah. their ET friends. You know, this exactly. is a whole show. We could do a whole show on this, but I've got <laughs> other questions. I, look, it's fascinating. People say, what happens with you die? It's so vast. I mean, you, yes. you could even just ask the question, what happens when you fall asleep? It's so vast. And there's so many frequencies and dimensions to play. Look, it's uh, look, millions of shows with you. Okay, from Angela, here's one. Please provide some incarnate, uh, some insight 
on disincarnate entities now this is an interesting question why how do they get stuck here and how do they move forward why how do they get stuck here and how do they move forward i suppose it's, that's an individual for each entity as well right yeah exactly it depends on you know some souls are just absolutely addicted to alcohol let's say mm -hmm. and the only thing when they're dying the only thing they want is oh you know i need to get that other i want one more drink and they just hang out in bars and around other alcoholics and they'll start to channel through an empty alcoholic's body mm -hmm. so that they can order another drink and experience at least another drink or sometimes i've seen one time i saw a being that was stuck in the burgundy vat at a winery <laughs> how i discovered him was he as soon as this woman tall woman who was standing in front of me in this like a um, free tour of the winery she was a wide open medium she didn't know anything about anything okay. but she was a wide open medium and that being saw the chance she liked alcohol she liked wine mm -hmm. and that's why she was there and then he he can get right into her body but he got as far as kicking her out and trying to take over the body but he wasn't capable enough it's like drunk driving <laughs> you know whoa <laughs> you can't quite handle <laughs> can't handle the vehicle <laughs> yeah he, he he didn't handle the vehicle he crashed That's literally so she just fell like a tree okay this Fortunately, is this she question. wasn't injured this is the interesting part given the shift occurring on this plane since yes. they're stuck here would they be subject to shifting in consciousness as well what uh, would the shift subsequently afford these entities the opportunity to return to love so she's saying as we're collectively shifting you know mm -hmm. are those stuck entities shifting too oh yeah it's it's all a matter of what i call blowing the picture okay everything what we do throughout life throughout our lifetimes you know incarnations as souls we we're like photojournalists and and so we're constantly creating images of every experience we ever have mm -hmm. wherever we are in the body out of the body whatever we're creating the image of our experience and filing it in our memory banks most of those millions and millions of images are not they don't bother us they don't uh, hang us up or anything like that because they're not reactionary yeah. okay. they're not full of emotional charge and reaction but when we have a traumatic experience especially the one that kicks starts everything is a physical traumatic experience where you're injured or hurt severely physically then you know even when you bang your toe on a coffee table for just a split second you go out of your body right not there and then you come back and you go ow and hop around and all that stuff <laughs> so that moment when you hit it traumatize yourself on a physical level pain level as spirit you momentarily leave by the time you come back that unconscious survival part of the mind takes a picture of that instant of pain and you being unconscious and preserves that as part of the survival information but it's held in an unconscious place so that when you come back you're sitting on top of it you don't know it's there until you get to the place in deeper meditation and whatnot you're able to go oh yeah it's time to un unload those unconscious pain uh, pictures and when you even get one of those over the years each one of those starts to accumulate pictures that stick on to the original pain picture and keeps on adding to them so all of us in our minds have big file cabinets full of pictures that are associated with the original pain which have nothing to do with anything <laughs> that's why we have strange reactions it's like doesn't make any sense why am i reacting this way and 
And we also have aches and pains and experiences we, we say is, oh, my, something is hurting. But nobody hit it. Nobody stabbed it. Yet it feels it's hurting. And most of the times we can't heal ourselves because we associate, oh, this is my knee that hurts or my head that hurts or something that hurts my shoulder. And we rub it or whatever, put ointment on it, take medicine, whatever. Well, it doesn't do anything about anything because that physical pain experience is not in the body. It's in your mind, an unconscious level inside this one image that has the original traumatic pain to it. And then it's combined with later on a lot of emotional experiences, intense emotional trauma experiences start to stack on top of it because something within those pictures are matching. It's cataloged yeah. like a file cabinet. You match all the things with a red flag on it, yeah. put it in one file. And so, is this, is this why people get grumpier as they get older? <laughs> yeah, they start to accumulate a lot more pictures. You know, so, I, my school friends, I adore them, but I, they don't adore me anymore. And so, uh, so it's kind of sad. When we were young, we had so much fun. We laughed a lot. We were free. We were young. We were, and as they've got older, they just get grumpier and grumpier and they just get <laughs> together and complain about their lot. And there's one friend in particular who I adore. She used to be so funny. She used to be joke, 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 joke. And then quite a few years ago, about 12, 13, 15 years ago, I went to her, visit her overseas and she had lost her sense of humor. And I'm like, you used to be the best joke teller. And uh, yeah, and it's kind of sad as I've cleaned up my vibration, I'm no longer a vibrational match to them. That's you know, right. I can remember them when they were young and free and funny. And now they not. <laughs> And yeah. <laughs> they kind of don't want anything to do with me. They say it's because I'm into all this, you know, spiritual woo stuff. stuff. <laughs> I don't think that's the reason. It's just that, yeah, yeah, they're just that accumulation, as you've said, over years of the pain, the pain body, the, you know, and it just becomes their dominant vibration. The worry. And that's what happens to the souls that are earthbound. Okay, there you go. They're, there you have it. They have weighed down. down with all these pictures right. and they haven't let go of right and they live in it yeah so the minute they learn to let go of those images that those images are nothing more than images in their mind right instead of reality then they're free then they're so free any being could be free anytime and you we can help them by teaching them that or a spirit guide can and you know it can come from physical or it can come from spiritual right like because there's lots of people who say they do that you know they release earthbound stuff i was mm -hmm. speaking to a guy on the show last who who does that he douses and he sees you know pesky spirits and he kind of sets them free he didn't even know he could do it and he didn't know how to do it but he just started doing it <laughs> yeah and it has to be done from here it has one of the be people done. Yes, one of the ones, one of the souls, the ones helping that other soul that's disincarnated has to have a body, has to be incarnated. Why? Why can't because, their spirit guide help them? Yes, the spirit guides are there to help them, but they can't do this part because they don't have a body. Hmm. It's a different level. The beings that are stuck on a very body level. Right. They have to, they can only have it from a being that has a body, is in a body, then they'll be able to move on. Hmm. But the that's why angels are there all around these yeah. beings. Uh -huh. But the angels could say whatever they want to, to help them, uh -huh. but they can hear it. And it's like, it's like here, some people hear you, you know, you tell them some tool to use mm -hmm. but they don't practice it they just mm -hmm. go oh yeah, yeah thank you nice. I, that sounds really that sounds right on right. and then they don't do anything about it yeah it's mm -hmm. like that their guides are telling them the mm -hmm. angels are telling them but they can't make use of it but when someone who has is in the body mm -hmm. is able to do the same thing then they go oh for example 
I was in uh, Scotland. They have a lot of ghosts in Scotland. <laughs> All those castles. Oh, it's so much fun. And <laughs> Rafi and I were on this. We had a, uh, we tagged along with this uh, group, this group of Southern women psychics. <laughs> uh, about 10 of them. And so about 12, 13 of us were in a pod going around and we were on this tour in this castle. The tour guy was probably one of the finest teachers of history and stuff I've ever met. Mm -hmm. She, she could have easily been a history professor, but she's the tour guy. She's telling all these things, very fascinating. But I also noticed, Oh, there's this young woman in a uh, little gown, uh, nightgown looking forlornly out the window of this castle. And I can see the image she's looking at is her lover who went to war, didn't come back. And what happened was this woman committed suicide because with broken heart and everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she's, she's still stuck there waiting for her guy to come back. So I got out of my body, went over to her and I said, Hey, you know, uh, are you aware he's not coming back? Because he was already reincarnated and and she didn't want to hear that but i said are you aware you're not physically alive anymore mm -hmm. you know you're you're in spirit and she's like huh and then i said would you like some help to move on mm -hmm. you don't have to suffer like this anymore and she says yes i, I would like that so all i did was take the pictures that she was totally stuck on about her lover not coming back and, and about her suicide and everything. Took that, blew it up. She goes, ah, and she says, thank you. And then she, she takes off. But the funny part is I come back to my body and, and the, the tour guide is talking away and she says, and did you know that this castle is famous for the ghost it has. And I said, not anymore. Excuse me, that that's, um, doesn't happen to be a young woman in a pink negligee uh, uh, waiting for, you know, uh, lover to come back from war and she committed suicide. Oh, you know, the legend about the ghost of castle something or other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, Oh no. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I didn't know it was a legend, but did I you saw her. Yeah. You and, said. and she goes, where did you, you saw her in a book? Uh, I think there's a, there's a painting of her in a book. Uh -huh. I said, no, she was right over that window is where she's been standing for a long time. She goes, yes, that's the window that everybody, that's supposedly that's where she's standing. And, well, I said, sorry, I won't tell anybody, but she's not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah. And I said, you know, the spirit of this young woman, I helped her cross over. Cross over. So she's not there anymore, but I won't tell anybody because I don't want to take away your business. Yeah. <laughs> and she goes, it. You see that? And I said, Well, I saw that. She's not, I don't see it anymore. She's not there. And she goes, Oh my God, this is fascinating. And she turns to the rest of the group, Do you know what he's talking about? And they go, yeah. And then she goes, anybody else see that? And they all go, yeah, <laughs> we're all psychics. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, oh my God, I, I want to go with you. <laughs> I bet you changed her life. I tell yeah, you. It was, it was a lot of fun. But <sighs> that's rare. She, this being, this young lady being, was ready to go. She was at a pretty high vibration. It's been a long, you know, I don't know, several hundred years. But uh, then we went underground in Scotland to the more seedy parts of the town. They built towns on top of each other. So the old towns are still underneath that nobody, you know, it's all done with. So there was a tour of going into the underground to look at some of the streets and buildings of the old town that they built this other town on top of. So we go 
oh, it's creepy. You know, it's just everything's dark and musky and everything. And so we're going around and sure enough, there's these old dead pickpockets oh. running around, pinching people's butts and everything. And, oh. and, and then especially when a woman, you know, screams and Whoa, who touched me and things like that. And everybody else there is saying, oh, I, I, I didn't touch you. And, no, no, no. and they're just laughing and having a great time and just pickpocket. They can't pickpocket anybody. So now they're, they're jokesters and kind of harassing people and getting, you know, their, their jollies about that. Getting their kicks. Did you yeah, move them getting... on as well? Did you say, okay, guys. Well, I gave them a chance. I said, hey, you guys. And finally, I got their attention. Yeah. Because they're in a very low level, so they, they don't see a lot of stuff going on on a higher level. Uh -huh. So I go down and said, hey, you guys, you want some help? And, you know, you've been playing this game for a long time. Aren't you bored? Don't you want to move on? And you know what they said? All of them. They said, no, leave us alone. We love it. We want to do this. I said, have it your way. <laughs> well, as, as David said on the last show, he can see that he, because he, we were talking about the land and regenerating the land. We weren't as specifically talking about this, but he can, he does this. Like he did, you know, he can, he can find them on a Google map and he moves because they sort of disrupt the land when people try and grow things. Anyway, I'm moving on to the next question. <laughs> Look, I, did I hope I answered, we answered that and Angela had more to say, but Barbara said, I've been thinking about this for so long. I'm curious It's time, if it's time for human experience as all is in the now. I'm thinking in terms of numerology or astrology. Why is there any relevance? This perspective will be interesting. I don't understand the question. I'm curious. If time <laughs> is a human experience, as all is in the now, if thinking in terms of numerology or astrology, why is there any relevance? This perspective would be interesting. And she says, if um, said that you work on healing yourself, let's say through sound therapy, and if this impacts uh, back and forward ancestry lines or other aspects of self, surely this is something achievable more easily by those already in a on the flip side <laughs> or no longer currently in their body um are you understanding this question uh mm. in the body in right in that place of bliss love i'm looking for shortcuts lol does this become a co-creation i don't really understand the question no i think what she's trying to say is is if everything is in the now, now. then what benefits are there for astrology, numerology, or this kind of healing or that kind of healing. Well, the thing about what is being in the now, it just means being spirit, recognizing, being aware that you're spirit. Because being in the now, the only way you could be in the now is if you're out of time. You know, if you're not a hostage to time. Mm -hmm. And you're not thinking in terms of past and future and a logical order of things. That's spirit. So whenever somebody is, ah, present, bright, right here, enthusiastic, joyful, present, they're, that, they're just that much more in spirit. They might not be fully in spirit, but they're, much more in spirit than the average person. And so that is, if you can be that and realize that, you don't need anything else. But all these other things, like anything, you know, Astrology, doesn't matter numerology. what kind of healing or numerology or anything else, they're all tools that's been invented along the way to help us make our steps toward being right here, right now. So astrology, my, you know, a chart could be about the whole next year or mm -hmm. 10 years mm -hmm. or the past, but it's, if you use it to go, okay, all right, I'm learning this. Like dream analysis, you learn stuff. And every time you learn, if what you're learning and what you're practicing from what you learn is to be able to have being the spirit that you are. Then you're more present right here, right now, all the time. 
And the more you start to be the spirit that you are, the more you start to claim being that light of the world. Yeah. You start to eliminate everything. And you can and, sort of transcend your chart, so to speak. You can yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. You know, the chart is just as a tool, not to get you more stuck. Yeah. You know, if the chart says, says, mm, oh, gee, your aspect is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so don't even bother getting out of bed today. <laughs> then it's not helping you any. <laughs> but if you read your chart and, and some people like to look at their chart and go, oh, okay, I get it. This is what I have to learn how to do. You know, I have to learn how to respond to these forces differently instead of becoming the effect of all these forces. Yeah, and yeah. this is a way I can do it. Yeah. That you're taking steps. So she's saying here too that um, when you're doing healing, like sound therapy or something, does this impact back and forward ancestry line and other aspects of self? Surely this is something achievable. So I guess she's saying as you're healing your stuff in the now, is it affecting your ancestors and all that you're carrying, that sort of collective consciousness? Oh, yeah, you affect everything. Uh, it's affecting it in front of you and behind you in time and space. You know, that again, there is no time and space. It's kind of yeah, hard to wrap up. That's why it in. affects, it affects yeah. everything. Mm. Yeah. So I guess that would be a yes already on the flip side. And okay, so she's saying that if you're healing your stuff and you're carrying some of the, um, you know, let's say the unworthiness stuff that was my mother's and father's and ancestors, and as I heal it, does it heal it for those people on the flip side too? They don't have to come back in and go through the karma of trying to heal it. I think that's her question. Depends. Sometimes, well, basically it will make it easier for everybody, you know, but then just like those pickpockets, there are those that everyone has free will, right? They can choose. No, no, no. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not gonna, I'm, you can't take this away from me. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you could forgive someone, but if they don't forgive themselves, you know, they have to be able to have that, yeah. receive it. Yeah. There's, okay. So we've got three questions left. Okay. Um, one says, how do you develop psychic abilities, which is a big question. We might get back to that maybe at the end. Judy says, that's from Yonette. Judy says that she's like her mother's in a home. She's 92 and she visits the, you know, the folks there between 95 and 100. Uh, ask why they are still here. Why haven't they passed? <laughs> they say they are done. Yeah, these old people say they're done. I want out of here. I don't understand why I wake up every day. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, it's, it, isn't it past the time? <laughs> Shouldn't that be, I've Look, gone a few days. <laughs> I've had this question. You go into old people's homes and you see people that are completely, you know, like why are their bodies still alive? Why doesn't the soul just like dis, you know, disconnect and, and let the body die? And sometimes people are awake and alive, and, but they're done. They're like, why am I awake? A friend of mine's mother who has transitioned, she spent years asking that question. She was not sick, but she was old and she was like so happy and ready to go. And, every, and she'd like put everything in order. She'd given us away all her stuff. She'd written the will and she kept living. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because she was getting a lot done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, people think that they have to get things in order if they're getting ready to go. Mm -hmm. But no, I mean, get things in order so that you could fully be here, and when you're done, you can go. You know, everybody has a different way of leaving. And my mom, bam, she three years, she took care of everything, and I can, you know, we talked about death and dying for three years every time we had a chance. Mm. And she would say, oh, yeah, I don't want to do this, and I want to do that, and blah, 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 and and you, you can tell she's packing her bags. But she kept on living, you know, very healthy. Um, she played golf, everything. She was doing everything like normal, but she's getting ready. And when she was all done getting ready, then one night she goes to bed and then doesn't wake up. My dad, on the other hand, 
<laughs> and my mom died when she was 65, I think. And then my dad, on the other hand, lived until he was 91. And the last four or five years, you know, it's just like, well, the, especially the last three, two to three years, he's, he was hilarious. I, we get a call from his, uh, he was in the, the last uh, couple of years, last year and a half, he was in a, uh, what do you call it? Um, um, elder care home. It was run by this <laughs> wonderful Romanian couple. And, and he and usually just maybe one other person were, were their residents there. They took great care of him on the physical level, but basically he just wanted to sleep. Mm. He wanted to sleep until he died. Mm -hmm. And the, where that came from is earlier in his life, he was deathly afraid of dying. <laughs> I mean, he can handle all kinds of things, but when it came, he couldn't even talk about death. Right. So Rafi and I would give him books by mediums and afterlife and near death experience. Well, all kinds of different things mm. just, just to have around. And he read, he would open, he'd go cover to cover. I don't know how much of it he retained, but he, he would go through the motions of reading everything, but he wouldn't talk about it. He might say, well, that was a good book or that was interesting or whatever. Definitely when my mom wanted to talk about dying for the three years before she died, Basically, I mean, we would do this at the dinner table, <laughs> at their dinner table, and he would just concentrate on eating the food. This wall comes down and no communication. So then when it got to where he's getting older and a lot of his older friends were going off and we would joke about, he would joke about them, you know, all his friends are all Dying, so yeah <laughs> he doesn't have people to play golf with anymore <laughs> and things like that so we we laugh about it he laughed about it but when it came to the actuality of dying it was very very hard for him to even think about it and i can tell he was terrified yeah. so yet he didn't want to be here <laughs> anymore he just i mean you know, especially when he starts to not be able to be physically, he can't play golf, he can't do this, that, the other thing. So it's like, you know, how much TV can you watch? Yeah. And, and, uh, and he's never been a very open communicator. So even when we visit, oh, glad you're here. And he leaves us in the living room and he goes off into his study and reads newspapers and watches TV. And, and so he had very little to live for. He just, and after a while, he's, you know, achy and nothing major. He's never got really sick or anything. Nothing's ever gone really wrong in his body. Very strong. Um, but it just goes on every day and every day and every day. And finally, he's, he's just like, you know, let me out of here. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to keep doing this. But when it comes to the actuality of leaving, no, I'm too scared of dying. Yeah. So I don't want to die and I don't want to live. Mm. That's a really tough situation. That's tough. Very, very tough. tough. So it taught me a lot, you know, because it's so tough. And, and because I'm perfectly fine. You want to go? Great. I'll support you all the way. If you want to stay, we can get you healing. We can do this, that, and the other thing. Support you all the way. No, I don't want to be here. I don't want to go. <laughs> do something. <laughs> so for, the, okay. for, for the majority, you would say that there is, uh, especially in the older generation, maybe, uh, there is just this fear of the unknown that keeps them in their body, even when they're... Fear suffering. of change. Fear of change. Fear of yeah. the unknown. Yeah. You know, yeah. He was afraid of the change mm. and then the unknown. And so people like him take a long time. And what he did was basically he started to have more and more dementia. Mm. 
he forgot he was afraid of dying. There you go. <laughs> I mean, everything has a purpose, right? Yeah. So yeah. if we don't get stuck in our judgments about, well, why aren't they going? Or they should hurry up. If, if they've got nothing to live for, why don't they go? Or if they got something to live for, why don't they, they do something? No, yeah. it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Each person has their way and they're going to do whatever they're going to do to get themselves out of here. Yeah. And until the moment they go, their business isn't done here. Mm. I suspect that from Judy, uh, my mum is in assisted living, she's 92. Maybe, oh, I don't know, how does she help her mother enjoy what time she's got left or help her transition? I guess that's, I don't know, you can do your best. You can have conversations with them. You can give them, well, you can do your best. You did your best with your dad. Um, and ultimately, I had to learn. Well, it's up to them. Yeah. It's enjoyment is different strokes for different folks. It's, yeah. it's the, what was enjoyable to my dad doesn't seem enjoyable to me. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's totally different. Yeah. And once I realized that some years ago, oh, it made things so much better because he didn't like this and that he didn't want to go there. He didn't want to be a bother. He didn't want this and want that, but he didn't know he didn't have much. He wanted. He was happy to just so sit and watch telly. He was happy to just sit there like a cat, you know, and, and just turn his back towards you. You know, that's how cats hang out. They turn their butt towards you. Yeah. Right? Tell and, me about it. <laughs> and that's the way they respect you. Really? You know, they're, they're, Let me show you. They're my letting butt. you. Yeah, here's my butt. I'm going to look away from you, but I want to hang out with you. Mm -hmm. And my dad was just like that. I don't want to talk to you. I'm going to go read my newspaper in the other room, but I, I want to hang out with you. I'm happy you're here. I'm happy. All right. Here. Well, here's one from Elise. Uh, uh, it, it's interesting regarding vanishing. So she's saying that uh, regarding items vanishing right before your eyes, typically they can be found in completely different locations where there are witnesses to prove it. I asked my deceased father if it was him. I'd love to know what's happening and how and why I can influence a better outcome. So she's talking about things kind of coming and going, um, physical objects. And uh, yes. I think that she said it was a long Happens question. A lot. <laughs> Yeah, it was a long question and I've sort of shortened it, but she said something like, you know, she'd, uh, she thought it was a husband and, um, and then she'd ask him and he didn't have memory or whatever. And then it started happening to him. He started sort of losing, misplacing things or things started missing. And <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it was a much longer question, but I've kind of shortened it a bit. I, I, I must admit the other day I walked upstairs and there's a hatch to the ceiling that you have to push up and it was pushed up. And I said to my daughter, have you been trying to get in the ceiling? There's nothing in the ceiling. There's no, there's just bats, you know. It's, just, it's not like a storage place. Uh, it's just for people to get up there to change lights and what have you. And she said, no, no, no. And it kind of freaked me out because I noticed it like at about one o'clock in the morning. I walk upstairs and this thing has been pushed <laughs> and moved. And I'm like, damn, is there someone in the house that's doing this? Like who the hell did that? But Yeah, so do you want to talk about things that are sort of you want to talk about that yeah well particularly that particular person i'd recommend we just let's see i think there's a show is it next week uh but when when you go to our uh radio site uh, voiceamerica.com empowerment channel the show the overall show title is living the miracle with michael and Raphael tamara if you look that up you'll be able to go to the right side of the screen. It's a whole catalog of 107 shows or six shows already in the archives. And one of the latest ones that might not even have aired yet is on the miracle, lost and found miracles. Uh -huh. And we talk about things this spring. We talk about that several times in several of our recent shows of things materializing, dematerializing, you know, Something sometimes over great distances, mm -hmm. sometimes over great time. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I've had so much of that in my life. Mm -hmm. And it all depends on, you know, there's no one answer. Some of it was spirit uh, having great fun with us. 
Yes. No, it's not not like the pickpocket spirits that are stuck, but spirit higher level spirit. Yes, going celebration. You know, this is really fun. Mm, fun things happening, colorful fun things happening that there's no logical explanation for. Mm -hmm. And then other times it's lessons to learn. You know, uh, okay, were you able to let that really go, or are you still trying to hold on to it? The thing, the physical thing, or yeah, the, the physical thing that disappears. Story around the thing, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so each one's different, and it's different for different people. And then, yes, a lot of times it's loved ones on the other side finding ways to communicate. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I worked with this elderly couple many, many years ago where the husband died, and um, his wife asked if if I would help her with being able to communicate with her with her deceased husband's spirit. And so we start working on it. And I said, but he was very capable being, so was she. But he started to, on his side, he started to practice with the little things like turning the light switch on and off. Mm -hmm. Electronics and electrical stuff is the easiest mm -hmm. for spirit to manipulate. And so he'll flicker the light, but he only did it at the exact times that meant something to her yes. or to them. Yes. And then he got better and better over time, over mm -hmm. several months. He got from flickering lights to, to um, a turning on the radio right when she walks into the room and it's on a song that they loved or something like that. Right. And the graduation gift for her was he uh, uh, started opening his garage door at exactly the time he was an accountant by profession and very meticulous, you know, orderly and meticulous. So when he was working, uh, he would come home at the same time every day so she could pretty much time her clock with when the garage door opens. And so, oh, yeah, not only is he home, but it's whatever it was, 4.30 or 5 o'clock or whatever it was. And that started to happen exactly at the same time as before the garage door would open by itself right. mm -hmm. and and then she will know oh yeah hi and they start to talk so so that was a way he was helping her start to be able to communicate spirit to spirit mm -hmm. with him mm -hmm. and to expand her awareness and mm -hmm. helped her and so we the three of us kind of worked together for a couple of years and it was a lot of fun it was yeah. a lot of fun well, I suspect that this leads into that question from Yannette who said, how do I develop my um, psychic abilities? How do we develop? Um, because, you know, you, this stuff is only confusing when you haven't got access to your own guidance. Then you're in this like, what's happening? What's happening? Who's doing it? What's happening? You're in that, confuse, that confusion. But if you can go and chat to dad and say, are you, are you moving stuff around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and he can say then, oh, no then you've kind of got yeah yeah but also you could you could get your own yes or no by tuning into your crown chakra your intuitive knowingness and just go get quiet and just go okay is this my dad uh trying to communicate with me yes or no and you'll get yes or no that's well, a good start you can set up a physical um sensation so you can say Give me a sensation on my <clears throat> right hand if it's a yes or, you know, like a cold wind or a pressure or something or give me a sensation on my left, it's a no. Like if you're not receiving that telepathic, you can sort of tune into your body and ask that for sensations too, right? To get yes. Yeah, and if, if the being is able to do that, if no. to do that, and if they're willing to cooperate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So developing psychic, uh, uh, you know, awareness or abilities, um, it's, a big, it's a big question. It's, uh, <laughs> what, what, what would you say, you know, just generically, just getting still, really much of what we've spoken about, getting st still, tuning into the center, your center? Yeah, that's because everything comes from that. You got to get grounded first mm. and um, um, find your own space to be. Finding your own space to be means, means being yourself as the spirit you are. And so that's going within and starting to recognize one of the 
easiest ways to get going on this and probably effective and productive is to recognize, oh yeah, how much of the energy I'm going through, everything from thought, thoughts to emotions, to sensations, to everything, the feelings, how much of it is mine? How much of it's not mine? And starting to be able to sort out, oh, because pretty much everybody generally goes through life taking the whole thing on and carrying around a ton of other people's baggage, thinking it's their responsibility. They have to solve it or else they can't move on and not moving on because they're still trying to solve something they can't solve. If they only learn, oh, I don't have to solve it if it's not mine. I can, I don't, not only I don't have to be responsible for it, I can't be responsible for it. Mm -hmm. I got to let go of being responsible for other people's problems and energies and thoughts and everything, feelings. Once you start to do that, and it's a long process because it's so, mm, what would you say? It's so habitual. So everybody assumes since I'm feeling it, it's mine. Yeah. yeah. Since I'm thinking it, I, I'm, I'm thinking it in my own head, it must be mine. Yeah. No. Yeah. We're, we're like these amazing receivers, okay. receiving stations. Mm -hmm. We're getting broadcasts all the time. Yeah. As, as I'm None of those about, broadcasts are ours. As I'm thinking about Yannette, you know, she has a job where she's responsible for a lot of children and a lot, you know, she's head of a school. So she's ah. kind of got um, head mistress, uh, master mistress, you know, head. So she's got a lot of people kind of looking to her. Yes. I suspect that for her, you know, this applies in that letting go of everyone's expectations and their wants and then, you know, like just letting go of that stuff, clearing her field and, and knowing that as much as she's responsible for the operation on a day-to-day -day basis, everybody else is responsible for their own stuff. Yeah. Like, and to do that, to clear her field, she needs to start really simple and just go, okay, is this thought mine or yeah. not? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. How much of what I'm feeling right now isn't mine? Mm -hmm. And then once you get, you know, this is not my thought. Okay, great. Let's put this thought in a rose and explode. it. So it's an active way of clearing it out. And then ah, oh, 60% of what I'm feeling, I thought it was indigestion. <laughs> oh, that's not mine. Okay, let's put that 60% of the energy that's not mine that I'm feeling into that rose and explode it. And you might go, whoa, I don't have indigestion or I feel fine. Or I still feel a little bit queasy, but, you know, way less. Yeah. Then you go, okay, that's working. And then this anxiety I'm experiencing. Okay, how much of it's not mine? Oh, 25%. Okay, let's put that in the rows and explode. So you do that one thing at a time, and it's not going to take care of everything, but you'll start to notice, oh, with each one, I'm starting to feel, feel like better. It. Yeah. I'm starting to be able to think better. I yeah. have more energy, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, oh, like that friend you were talking about before who was really funny before when she was young but mm -hmm. now she's grouchy many people will discover no they don't change like that who they really are it just gets covered over and crusted oh, yeah. over and and buried yes you know? absolutely i know that so, that funny brilliant person's still in there i know she's oh, yeah. in there i know she's in there you're in there but, oh, yeah, she's so grown up now. <laughs> she's so serious and grown up and serious. Anyway. Okay. Um, right. Fat, you are fascinating. I love talking to you. <laughs> uh, I could talk to you all day. Okay. So exploding the rose. You've said that many times. I guess you could maybe put it into the cosmos too or into a star and, or you could, you know, you can use different visualization, like just, just having that intent to have that energy leave you and put it into a rose or put it into something and will you say explode it. It's funny yes. because I get indigestion a lot when I do these shows. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I mute myself.
because <laughs> I do a lot of burping. That's why, I, you know, I forget that I've muted myself. And I, I know it's not coming from you. It's probably coming from people witnessing this or who are going to witness this. Yes, because there's no time. So people who are already, you know, tuning in, like people who are asked, sending you the questions, they know this is going to happen. Uh-huh. Yeah. So they're already there. <laughs> So, yeah, so I get a lot of indigestion and I used to think maybe if I don't eat before I do the shows, I won't have indigestion. Makes no difference. No, it's all energy. <laughs> yeah. All right. The last question. How long have we been yakking for? Oh, nearly two hours. Two hours. <laughs> oh, I know. You've got to go. You have to go. But I just, there was something that occurred to me about you because you talk a lot about death and dying and preparing to die and, uh, you know, you've had five near-death experiences. And so, and so you're like, you're teaching us you're teaching us to prepare for the next adventure. Then, you know, and I started to think about this because a lot of people are talking about on the show future Earth and the coming changes. And some people are saying that there might be a supernova that explodes the Earth or in order to ascend to the next level of dimension of consciousness, we have to leave the physical body and take on another body. Like there's so much information out there. And I started to think maybe that's why Michael speaks about this preparation of death so much. Is it because in order to ascend uh, collectively as a human race, there's going to be a mass sort of like death thing happening? Or no, it's, it's um, because death from the soul's perspective is just a realizing you're not a body. Yeah. And, and you're not in any kind of a container. You're not beholden to anything here. So the, the practice and the, the awareness of dying, what we call dying, is basically more and more realizing, truly, I'm not of this world. Yes. I'm in it. The more you're not of the world, the more you can be here. And once you're fully here, you get to leave. <laughs> Say that again. Once you're fully here, you don't have to be here anymore. The reason everybody's still here and they don't have a choice in the matter is because they're constantly trying to get out of here. Yeah. But once you're fully here, you, don't, you can leave. Now, because you don't need this anymore. Yeah. Well, what makes you fully here? It, it's totally you realizing you're totally, fully spirit. And all of this stuff doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. it's, it's here for your learning. So you can get to, you can free yourself. And that's why none of us ever, especially as children, and the more aware as children we are, uh, the more we feel like we don't belong here. Because we don't. Yeah. Yeah, we but we have to be here, but not belong. So um, your guide said to you, you're a spirit mob, you know, you've, you've done well, you've, you don't have to go back. And you kept coming back. You said, can, well, how can I help better in a physical body or in a spiritual body? And they said, oh, definitely a physical body. So you said, all right, I'll go back. So w would you, if you, when you do eventually, you know, let go of this physical form, do you think you'll come back mm -hmm. again? Don't know? I'll, I'll decide that when I get there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I learned don't make promises you can't keep. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that might be you know, thousands of years in the future. I always think to myself, if we're evolving as a human society, why wouldn't I want to come back and like experience what we're all doing to get there? You know, we're all cleaning up our vibration and having these conversations and we're all these light workers or light weavers because we're creating this new earth. Why wouldn't we want to come back and enjoy the creation that we're all participating <laughs> in now? That's what I think. Yeah. Oh, beautiful Michael Tamora. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was very joyful to be with you today. <laughs> Thank you. Always a joy. <sighs> Another fabulous two hours with Michael Tamora. Mm, just wonderful he's amazing just love michael uh he had to go feed the cats <laughs> so i didn't chat to him much after the show i'm hoping to get him out to australia at some point to do some teaching yes he just knows how to he just he's just amazing just 
wonderful, wonderful teacher. Hope you enjoyed the show and I hope for all those people that sent me questions in from our little inner sanctum tribe. I know that I didn't get through all of them because some questions had sort of different layers to it. I was just reading Angela's question. Uh, there was part of it I didn't ask. But anyway, we can discuss that. We can discuss all the, those things in the inner sanctum with me. You can ask my mob. Uh, same mob, I would suspect, as Michael. <laughs> same spiritual consciousness we're both tapping into. That's why I love him so much, you know. Like attracts like. Uh, yes, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, who's coming up? I don't know. It's been two hours yakking with Michael. I've no idea who's coming up. Oh, okay. Yes, I do. Inner Sanctum. Uh, we've got two this month, in the month of March. We have Peter Panagor who's coming in, who had a near-death experience. Interesting when Michael was talking about that being in the no thing, the nothing and the everything, that place of source, oneness, infinite, I don't know, divine flame. What did he call it? So many names we could give it. Peter had the same experience when he had a near-death experience. Uh, yeah, and the question I wanted to pose was why, do you, why does a human need to experience that? Like if we're kind of in this lower level, why do we kind of shoot back to the infinite level, like there's many layers in between, and then come back down into this level? I suspect it's um, um, to realise that this world, and you know, to not have the resistance, to not get so caught up with the dramas of this world, whether they're personal or political or social or global or galactic. You know, we get so engaged, personally engaged and upset with the dramas of the creation of life, physical life and all other life. And when you can meet it from your broader perspective, from your divine perspective, from your higher self or from the God perspective, as Esther would say, See eyes through, see life through the eyes of source. When you can look at life through the eyes of source, you can be in the world but not of the world, as Michael said, as many people have said. And you can enjoy the ride, all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly. You can enjoy the drama as we enjoy a movie. We watch a movie and we cry and we laugh, and then it finishes and we go, "Gosh, that was a good movie." If, if, if only we could have that same detachment to our physical lives like enjoy the drama get upset cry wail and go oh i'm so enjoying this anyway enjoy the grief enjoy the laughter enjoy all of it view it from a detachment the buddhists talk about this this, this loving detachment not you don't care about it it's just that it's not who you really are who you really are is the eye in the middle of the hurricane the stillness point the calm, the peace, the joy, the excitement. Mm, beautiful. We can all journey towards living our lives more like that. A beautiful, joyous, peaceful detachment and enjoyment of life. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all for um, watching and listening again. Obviously, that's what I tried to do. I, we attempted to do with the book Awakened by Death is to show how you could go through the worst experience of your life and still find absolute enlightenment. In fact, some of the worst experiences wake us up to reconnecting to that still point, that center point, the eye in the middle of the hurricane. And um, many of the people who are in the book, near-death experiences or experiencing the death of a loved one, like a child, have uh, found that through the death experience awakened by death awakened to your true self so yeah thanks again for watching i'm going to go and have another cup of tea <laughs> love you all